Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. Today's show is really exciting because I have somebody who is just a delight. She is internationally renowned. I've got to tell you, she is in the entertainment field and she's going to entertain you today. She has a background in singing, songwriting. Well, she's been a model, a radio show host, a yes, oh my gosh. She has done things from writing columns, to also teaching. She plays instruments, and I'm gonna let her tell you which ones, but she comes from a long lineage of, well, musical talent, and she will also share that with you. I've been quite impressed with the things that she shared with me because not only does she have, does she have talent in music, but in personality and intellect, and I want her to share so much of her inter spirit with you because she's going to share the things that are going to help you kind of develop some things of inspiration that will move you in a way that you might not have helped have have helped have had that spirit helped before and she does that in a way that I even haven't been moved like this before. So with me, Monday Michiru, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rebecca. Wow. <laughs> I am really excited. I've got to tell you because you have moved me. And the first time that I talked with you, um, not too very long ago, we had quite an awesome conversation. And not only did we have it one-on-one, -on -one, but then we ended up having a lot of people on the conversation and it was a lot of fun, but our initial conversation really inspired me because it was really, not only did you embrace me as a person, but you just ended up bringing out a lot because of the things that you had just in your inner spirit. And one of the things that you shared was your history and it was your family traditions and not just how genetically made you were in the artistic abilities that you had, but just traditionally in family traditions that you had that many of us don't have anymore because of just how fast paced we are. It was really very inspiring. Can you tell me a little bit just about your your family traditions now, and then I want to talk to you more about all of the things that you're doing. Okay. I guess when you're saying tradition, you're talking about the fact that I come from, um, my parents are jazz musicians, um, and I got into music, and I now have a son who's in college studying music. So we're a three-generation musical family, um, and uh, yeah, so that's basically it. <laughs> you do, but you're all really tight knit though. You have a really uh, tight knit family. Yeah. Well, like any other family, I think, you know, not like specifically super tight knit or anything like that, but that's sort of like our language that we speak with each other. Yes. You know, music can be a language and um, it's, it's definitely a form of communication. So we have an added layer of communication amongst us. Definitely. You do. And communication is really very important. And oftentimes we don't do that anymore because of how fast paced our society is. And the language that you guys do speak is so important because it takes a lot of patience to have the skill set that you do. And I know that you have played with your mother as well. I've played with my mother, my stepfather and my father. So I can't wait for my son to get to a level that we can sort of start integrating him with some of our performances and recordings. That would be fun. <laughs> yes. And you are internationally known. You've had a number one hit, You Make Me, in Japan. Tell me a little bit about your number one hit. Oh, well, um, this is an album. Well, it's a song that was in an album that came out in 1998. The name of the album was Double Image. And that was the single that came out of it. And funny enough, when I recorded the entire album, um, I didn't have that song in there. And we were looking at the songs um, 
you know, my manager and I, who also worked for the record label, and we were sort of feeling like, like there wasn't one song that was a, a single, you know? And I thought, I think I have something that I started that might be really good. Can you pull a little more budget for me? And he finagled a little bit more from the record label and, you know, I recorded it. Um, and I just had a feeling in my gut that this was gonna be the one. And that has probably made me more known than any of the other songs that I'd released to date, probably in Japan anyway. <laughs> this is pretty exciting. Let me ask you a question. When you were recording that or touring for that, was that how you ended up obtaining lead roles in? <laughs> yes. No. No, actually, um, I was living in LA, um, where I had grown up for a good period of my, my, my youth. And um, I got scouted by somebody to be a lead in a film. And the film was about uh, an opera singer. And I had never acted. It wasn't really something that I was interested in pursuing as a career by any means. Um, but because I had the classical music background playing the flute, and also because I was a singer, um, they thought that I would be appropriate for the role. Plus, the director was known to only debut people who had never acted before in his lead, you know, as a lead in his films, which was a really interesting and different perspective to yes. film making and, um, and, you know, character building, or I don't know if you call it character building, whatever it is, you know, of playing characters by people who are closer, closest to the character without pretending to be the character, if that makes any sense. So, so that was the way he, you know, approached his filmmaking and his actors and actresses. So I got chosen for it. And um, that's how I sort of started my career in Japan. And it, it you know, it garnered me a um, Best New Actress um, award, which is really great. But it sort of put me in the spot because I wasn't a trained actress. It wasn't something that was in the cards in my mind. So I suddenly, I felt, you know, I was um, suffering from uh, uh, imposter syndrome probably for the first four years or so. No. Yeah, living in Japan, I was thinking, wow, this isn't really, this isn't where my talent is, you guys, you know. But um, fortunately, the um, management company I was with, which was also one of the producers for the film, happened to also um, have a recording division so I just sort of kept you know saying hey how about music how about if you uh -huh. use me as a musician how about if I write music for you so I just kept needling them until they you know um, gave me the, a crack at it um, um, I can't say that the first album I did did was a you know great success it wasn't <laughs> but I think they saw that I was really passionate about it and yes. I did have something and I just kept knocking on doors, you know, with different producers, different DJs, different artists and saying, hey, let's do something together. And, and eventually, you know, got my way in there. So that is something I really want to share with the audience. And that's what has been very inspirational for me about you, that you really don't find too often. And that is that That was really what inspired me about you that hasn't really resonated with me from someone else is that you knew so deeply and someone gave you an opportunity as a lead, but you followed that passion and you were really saying, this is what I want to go after. And that's what I want to convey to the audience. When you know what you want to do, you really need to pursue that because that will stay within you. And like you said, needle you and kind of needle point, point you to the direction that you really need to go. You have to stay with it because if you don't follow your heart, you really truly aren't happy. And like you said, you felt kind of like impersonating, like you're really just not doing what you know you're supposed to do and you're kind of faking it. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, in your gut, when you're in the right place, you know, there's, I think, I think, especially when you're 
younger, maybe even when you're older, I'm not sure yet on that, but I think it's important to try different things because you don't know what opportunities could open up by trying. If I hadn't tried the acting role, even though I knew I wouldn't, you know, like know what I'm doing, I just had to have the blind faith that, gee, this is an opportunity that, like, who gets an opportunity to be a lead in a film? not pursuing it, like it just falls in your lap. I, I'd be a fool to say, no, I'm not gonna do it. You know, and, and I did, I did the best that I could and I was given opportunities as a result of that. So I think it's really important to sort of always keep your channels open and, and just sort of, you know, embrace things as they come and just sort of, you know, sort of like trying on clothes. Oh, let me, let me see this. Let me not say no to the yes. shirt. Let me try it on first. Okay, let me try it on. Yeah, I like it, but maybe it's not my color. But, oh, because I know now the shape looks good on me. Let me try another shape in a different color, you know. So I think it's just sort of part of that putting it onto your skin, trying things, internalizing it, letting it out. And then, and then that's where you sort of see the balance of is it right for me or not, you know. I have to agree with you. And taking that and looking at the perspectives is so important. And even if we don't have certain opportunities, looking at different perspectives from where we're at and seeing what they could be or what they could not be, because we don't know always what we have if we just stay in this linear position. Yeah. And then you have done something that a lot of people don't do, and that is take what they have and invest it in other people. And you are doing much of that now with taking the skills that you have and providing other people with a skill set that's going to take them places as well. Yeah, so, you know, um, getting into music and particularly singing, uh, songwriting was something that uh, was something I wanted to explore and I did. And I felt that it was the way that I could best express myself so part of that of course is you know not just writing the music and also ended up uh, doing the production but also writing the, the lyrics to it so as time went on uh, while I was living in Japan I started to um, actually get called by producers and record labels hey you know do you mind if you uh, help out this young singer she doesn't you know she's never been in a studio and whatever so I started sort of getting into I guess artist development is what you would call it mm -hmm. and what I found is that it gives me great joy to be able to impart any wisdom or, or experience or knowledge that I could have and share that with someone who's coming up because that's something that I have enjoyed or you know the few rare occasions where there was um, the elderly states woman or man, you know, whatever, um, who hadn't been so generous to share information, you know, that's, that's hurtful. So I really believe in the concept of passing on information. I think that's really important. Um, when I moved back to the States, it was the year 2000. Um, I became a mother. My son is now 19 and we talked about the fact that he's, well, no, he's not 19 yet, ah, but in another month. Um, but, you know, we talked about the fact that he's in college now and he's, he's studying uh, music, alto sax jazz, as a matter of fact. But as a result, um, it sort of really fermented, you know, uh, that nurturing spirit inside of myself. Um, and uh, recently, the past two years or so, I was thinking, you know, what can I do to teach? Um, mm -hmm. And I didn't feel singing was really what I wanted to teach. I think there's a lot of great singers and singing teachers in New York, but I thought it had to be something unique that I can do, that I, I am good at, that no one else can teach. And what I discovered um, looking at various courses and um, curriculum offered in conservatories and music schools and colleges, whatever, was that there's no lyric writing classes. And I found mm -hmm. that really interesting because particularly as a singer, and if you want to be not borrowing other people's voice, meaning you're not borrowing their words, you're not borrowing their melodies. If you want to be expressing yourself purely, you have to learn how to do it, you know? And it's a very ethereal concept because they're really is no right in lyric 
writing, but there's a lot of wrongs. <laughs> so that's a good point, though. That is a really good point because there is so much creativity that goes into lyricism. And there's also a definite line between that and poetry. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, it's funny you say that because I was speaking with this guy um, who teaches poetry. He's a poet and he teaches at the new school in New York, great school. And he and I were speaking about the possibility of, you know, hey, you know, what do you think of the idea of lyric writing, you know, classes? He goes, you know, I actually was asked by the school to teach lyric writing. I said, really? He said, yeah, you know, because they figure I'm a, that's what I do. I write poetry. He goes, but I couldn't do it. After one semester, I, I decided to suspend it. And I'm like, really, why? He goes, it's a little hard. <laughs> and I could understand that because, um, again, there's no rule. Not, not even like, you know, poetry and also has its things, but there's also that it skims the surface of rules and no rules, but you know when you're not doing it well. <laughs> and it's That's similar to, to lyric writing, or rather singing the lyrics, because particularly if you're a singer, you just know how the melody will roll with the words. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. so... True. Yeah, it's anyhow. It's a it's a really fascinating um, thing for me to do. It's very challenging, and I did my first course over the summer, and it was a joy. I had great students, and they were super open. It was almost like having therapy because you know you're really sort of pouring your heart into into the expression of these words, and sometimes it's not always you know the good stuff. It's not just about love. And gee, I'm having a a great day and yeah <laughs> sunshine you know sometimes a lot of stuff like man i'm re and so reaching into yourself and pulling out some of the uglies and trying to beautify that into words into a melody is not always easy you know well you know it's really interesting that you say this and some people don't really understand why it's so important to understand language not yes. only the english language but other languages as well, because many of our languages come from the base of Latin languages, the Latin language. And yes. when you can understand that, that can open up a whole colorful palette of meaning. And yeah, sure. it can, yes, and it can really create expression in different ways. And so, I am going to venture to say with what you do and the amount of things that you can convey within the classroom is going to bring about even more creativity for you because as you're trying to share and teach, that is going to do, it's going to open up a whole, a whole new thing for you as a, as an instructor, as a yeah. professor. I think this is sort of the beauty of teaching. This is something that I discovered when I was helping out some of these singers um, in Japan was that by teaching them things, you know, I had to give an answer to their questions. And then things that would maybe be second nature to me or things that I hadn't thought about, the hows, was something I had to describe to them. And and in the description, I had to really sort of look into the inner workings of something. And, and this is the case that I'm finding with lyric writing, you know. Um, and again, because it's so hard to grasp certain things, it's, it's hard to teach that. And particularly the last summer session, and it looks like with the class that's coming up, that most of, my, um, most of the people who are interested to learn from me right now are, are Japanese, because I'm probably best known in Japan more than anywhere else. And the one thing that Japanese singers who are living in New York, because that's where I'm based, um, are struggling with is the idea of writing lyrics in English. So this is actually go there. part of the struggle. The grammar also can be an, an issue as well. So I have had to try to find different ways. You know, I've been thinking about this and, you know, so I've got a little angle that I'm going to come into uh, the first class with and see how it goes. <laughs> and I was just going to ask about the lyrics, Japanese lyrics, and how that equates. Right. Well, 
I don't write Japanese lyrics. I'm just going to be frank. I, I speak very good Japanese. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, I, I'm perfectly natural at it. But it's not really sort of my native tongue in my heart. So I've always um, written in English and sang in English. Although there's been a few times I've, I've, written, I've stuck in some Japanese into my songs, but that's not, you know. Anyhow, but um, with some of these um, singers that are coming in and they're wanting to learn to, you know, write in English, I was thinking about the fact that the Japanese lyrics that I've, well, I've translated, I have to mention, several Japanese lyrics into English. And the one thing that I notice about Japanese lyrics is that they have this beautiful ability to paint um, a, a landscape in your mind with their words. It's a real, like, amazing ability that they have. You know, the, the most, excuse my language, sorry to say this, but some of the most stupidest pop songs I've heard when I listen to the lyrics and, and you know, really <laughs> sort of analyze it. We're gorgeous. I'm like, wow, that's like mind blowing. How about if we up the music? No, anyhow, but, but oh, now I'm being mean. But anyhow, but the lyrics are, are really sort of outstanding. So I realized that uh, this next class, I'm probably going to have to um, go about it of let's translate something you've written in Japanese and let's try and, and bring that you know into English. So that's one of the things, one of the exercises I thought I would you know, use this time around. This is really exciting. You have a lot of really wonderful things that are on the horizon. And what, let me, what do you think are the most profound things that you have acquired that are gifts that you can provide to your students? most profound things yeah. well i think probably again going back to the idea of pulling out um you know what's inside of you i think some people might have a block for writing the last uh, series of classes i did there were a few students who had a block and they just didn't know how to break through the block you know through that wall so um you know as i'd mentioned before about the fact that it felt like a therapy sometimes I think it really is just the idea of you know for example if we're feeling depressed or if you we're feeling down about something sometimes it's better to distract ourselves with something else so we don't go down that rabbit hole of you know total darkness <laughs> you know yes. and stuff like that and I was talking to one um, student in particular who was like I really two of them actually who were like you know I, I don't want to explore those feelings because it'll really get me down and I'm like you have to sort of open yourself into there and even though it might hurt you know and just write it all down and then try to find just a beauty in it. You know, what is it that you can learn from this? What is it that you can maybe express to somebody that you can maybe share wisdom or philosophy or, or something that you hadn't thought about? How are you going to get yourself from this dark place into a lighter place? You know, what is the poetry that you can find in here? And, and it's, it's not easy, but, but it was interesting. You know, after you have a good cry session, sometimes the most beautiful things can come out. <laughs> Well, this is true. Let's, let's talk about your music for a minute. What, what do you think was the most inspirational pieces that you, that you would say come to mind? Um, I, you know, listen, every writer, whether they're poets or novelists or or any, any kind of creator everything they create they think oh this is the best thing i've ever done or this, <laughs> you know whatever it is they feel but it's almost like like your children it's a part of you so it's really hard to play favorites i just want to say that before i go into well but <laughs> but <laughs> i do have a few songs that um definitely for me lyrically stand out like wow that was something that i really sort of felt i stuck myself into um like well and probably one of them is um and i'm known for it in the house music world with you know like in the dance music house it sort of hit like around in 2001 or so um this remix that was done of it and it's called star suite and i was very pregnant at the time that i wrote it it's a um 
and I should say it's a collaboration with Shin Ichi Osawa, who is the leader of Mondo Grosso, and also this one other guy. So it's a suite, so there's three pieces. The third piece being, um, bless you. <laughs> the third piece uh, being, you know, with song, but it was a spoken word piece. So I wrote the whole thing as, as poetry, as, you know, as I'm speaking it like a dialogue of, of a story of, of, you know, um, my idea being after traveling a lot throughout Asia, like Thailand and Indonesia and, and other places, you know, you, you, you go sometimes to these, you know, smaller villages, not the city, even in the city you see it, but the smaller villages, you see this idyllic, um, beautiful, you know, landscape of, you know, tradition, and um, you know beautiful nature and you see the traditional cultures and how they eat and you know how they are with their family and the community overall and then you look into their cities and it's like the polar opposite and all of the you know the things about the city that can really s seem vigorous and stimulating but there's sometimes a loss of soul in it you know so I told a story about a, a young girl journey you know growing up in a small village coming to the city and then going back to her village to actually find what she had been searching for sort of thing so it's something that I see a lot it's something that really um, it, I feel also with myself you know so I live now in the countryside and and I love it but I still go to the city a lot uh -huh. um, yeah something, something like that is is something that yeah <laughs> Well, this is really exciting. I have been so inspired by you and I know that the audience is going to be too. How can they connect with you and find out more about everything that you've got going on? Um, well, so I do have the new website <laughs> and I have a contact information there. So um, you can reach at me at www.mondaymichiru.com. Perfect. I so thank you for your time today and everything that you have that you have done and the inspiration that you are giving to not only me, but the audience and your students. This is really exciting. Thank you. I really appreciate it. I, I appreciate this time and you've been so generous with me. I really appreciate everything. Ah, thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Reveille. I ask that you share all the information that you have heard today with your friends, your family, your loved ones, your colleagues, everybody that you know, and everybody that you don't. <laughs> thank you. Bye.